Welcome to the newest edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. I'm John Schmelk. It's all brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. I'm John Schmelk. He's been joining us for darn near a decade now. He is Matt Miller. He is now one of the great draft analysts over at ESPN. Matt, it's good to see you, man. Uh, are, are you like in full sprint mode right now? Are you sleeping? I mean, we are right now <laughs> hot and heavy with draft on everybody's mind. Yeah, not a lot of sleep in the month of April. That's okay. Uh, we get caught up in, in May and June for sure. So it's it's uh, for sure a sprint right now, you know, it's similar to how NFL teams are here right now, making sure you've got a handle on every player. Um, that's, that's the hard part for me right now is living in that fear of a player's name being called on day three that you don't have notes on. So I'm um, checking my list multiple times. I'm a week away from having to file my final rankings as well. So I want to make sure that you know, when you're tracking 500 players, guys can slip through the cracks and you're so I'm re- literally going line by line on my rankings list to make sure wow. that I didn't like, you know, hit hit a, a four instead of a six on a, a grade or something and accidentally move a guy down 100 spots. I, I've done that before. So that is uh, that is a true story of like a lesson learned of like, I didn't have a seventh round grade on that guy. But, you know, you put their final grade in and I put like a 42 instead of a 62 on a guy and uh had to had to correct that one so that's that's where I'm at right now oh man that's rough how deep do your final rankings have to go these days 150 150 what oh no like 500 500 yeah the is goal that is full to, list going on the website too or no it I believe it yeah it will yeah it wow will. Um, okay that is know, pressure uh, Woo. yeah A lot of my job has really changed since coming to ESPN. You know, last year was my first year on set for day three. I'll be back this year. And I learned a lot sitting there. I learned a lot about what I didn't know. And so this year has really been a priority for me to, you know, go back to some of my roots of, you know, when I was at Bleacher Report and we would break down every pick is going back to that mindset of, okay, it's not just, you know, we're talking about the first round guys on TV for months. It's like you can put those guys to bed pretty early now and start yeah. really cramming for day three. So it's it's been fun, you know, having the job kind of change back to what it used to be. But it is it's definitely a different type of preparation. No, that's awesome, man. That's great. Of course, you can check out all of Matt's great stuff, ESPN.com. He's on a million different shows. You'll be seeing him on NFL Live, the coverage of the draft for ESPN in a couple of weeks. Check all of that out. Matt does a fantastic job. All right, so let's start more with what you're hearing here, Matt. There have been a bunch of pro days. People start talking. You know, you talked about teams are now coming together to finalize their boards. The Giants scouts just came into the building a couple days ago. So I I think any rumors before this time about what teams were going to do were probably not sure how much you should believe those. When do you start buying what teams are selling in terms of what might start happening with some of these picks at the top of the draft? Yeah, I think it really depends on who you talk to within that team. You know, if I had a conversation a month ago with the general manager, I feel really good about that information at that time with the understanding that a lot can and probably should change as we get through pro days, we get through, you know, 30 visits, teams get through the tape. You understand that that information can change. So there are, you know, certainly, you know, like right now, yeah, I'm I'm buying some of the things that I'm being sold. It just depends on where it's coming from. And I I think that's the key is understanding who has information when, you know, during the season, area scouts are invaluable for helping us find players and having those discussions about players where like none of that means that the New York Giants are going to draft a guy. It just is helpful because they're running through those areas. Hey, tell me about Cody Schrader from Missouri. Boom. We can have that conversation. It has nothing to do with that team having interest in, in that particular prospect. This time of year, I think you get more pointed, more narrowed in your focus of, you know, are there any guys that you've eliminated from your board? Are there any guys that I need to know about medically that maybe I I wasn't aware of? So that is a lot of the conversations I'm having right now. It's never as pointed as, hey, Joe, who are you guys drafting at six overall? Um, You, I would love for it to be that way. Uh, Maybe, (laughs) maybe some people have that type of access. I don't. Uh, That would be awesome. But it's you know trying to to, I, I use this analogy the other day. It's like taking a puzzle and dumping it on a table upside down and trying to your, your job this time of year is to be able to get enough information to flip those pieces over. That's what you're trying to do. It's just, you know, get a nugget so you can flip a piece over and hopefully get closer to putting that puzzle together. All right. So give me a sense then. I think we feel pretty good about the, the Kayla Williams going number one overall. To the yeah. Bay, I feel right? really good about that. Yep. I agree. Yep. All right. I think we feel really good about the commanders taking a quarterback. I don't know if we feel really good about yep. who that quarterback is. 
Uh, and then the Patriots at three, it seems somewhat nebulous as to what they're going to do. So what are your thoughts here for how these first five picks are going to go? How heavy are Arizona and the Chargers trying to get out of there? Just so the Giant fans had an idea of what might be sitting there waiting for them when they eventually do pick at six. Yeah, so Caleb won. I feel that hasn't changed. I don't think it's going to. Number two gets interesting because it, it will be a quarterback. I I feel like like 90% Jaden Daniels and then, you know, maybe 85% Jaden Daniels. There's, there's always that little piece of you. It's like, well, maybe, you know, it's like, but it does feel like things are trending in that direction. Three, as you said, anyone's guess, nothing has changed with the New England Patriots. As far as that goes, anyone's guess, they could take a quarterback. They could trade. I think those are the two options, quarterback or trade. And it may come down to, you know, who's on the clock. It might literally be, Hey, we like Jaden Daniels. If he's there, we'll draft him. If he's not, we'll trade out. It might be we like Drake May. If he's there, we'll draft him. If not, we'll trade out. It might be that they like four quarterbacks in this draft and say, well, okay, we're in a great spot. We'll draft one. So I think with New England, you know, there's not a lot of intel. There's, you know, we have a lot of people in decision making roles that have never been before. You know, Elliot Wolf is the de facto general manager. You can go back and look at all the places he's been to try to get some ideas about what they'll do. He's never been a decision maker. So you have no idea, you know, what, what he's thinking or what his, you know, kind of priorities might be. And then you mentioned that Arizona and the chargers at four and five are in fantastic spots to potentially trade out, especially Arizona, because they also have picked 27 in the first round. And we know that money awesome for it loves to wheel and deal. I uh, loves to answer that phone on draft day. So we could see, I, I think that, you know, all the prevailing wisdom right now is that Arizona would trade out with the Minnesota Vikings who have picks 11 and 23 now because of their trade with Houston Texans and, and would be able to, you know, move up the board to get that quarterback. But it is uh anyone's guess right now what happens. I think three, four, and five, which is great news for Giants fans, three, four, and five are kind of the pivot points of this draft where everything could, could get crazy. Yeah, it could. <laughs> and I think where I'm sitting right now, man, and we were talking about this the other day on, on big blue kickoff live, if the Giants, and again, I don't know what the front office is thinking, what they think about the individual quarterbacks. We're talking theoretical here. If they want a quarterback, they're going to have to move up to get that player, right? They're yes, not going to be able to sit there yeah. at six. You agree with that, right? I, that's the way it looks right now. You at least have to protect your protect your flank. You want to make sure that the Vikings or the Broncos or someone else aren't coming up to get that quarterback is essentially where you're at. So, you know, if 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 it was a draft with no trades, you could probably sit at six and get right. that fourth quarterback, but there are trades. And I think Arizona and the Chargers are, have really kind of signaled that they're open for business. And uh, here's the problem. The demand for the quarterback is so high, right? You know, there are years yeah. where teams, oh yeah, they can draft a quarterback, but you have teams in the Vikings, not even to mention the first two teams picking in the Patriots, teams like the Vikings and the Broncos and the Raiders, who I would classify, maybe my classification is wrong, if I were them, I'd be desperate for a quarterback. I don't think you're sitting there like, oh, we're cool. We're going to go into the year. We're fine with this. Right. So I almost feel like if the Giants do want to move up to three or four, the competition's so heavy, that's going to cost more than the three twos, right, that the Jets paid to move up to get yeah. Arnold. I mean, the conversation starts with your one next year, and then it's, all right, plus how many other mid-round or first-round picks, right. even just to move up a couple of spots just because – the offers for, I think, those other three teams are going to be so huge. Yeah, and, you, and right now you're competing with Minnesota, who has two firsts this year. That's that's the rub. And the Giants, you know, you you make a trade um, for Brian Burns. You give up a second-round pick. I love that move. Love that move. But that's draft capital that you could have used to move up for a quarterback. So it's it's part of the calculus when trying to decide who can move up, who's likely to move up. The Vikings right now are – desperate and they have the draft capital that matches that and so i think that's where when you talk about a potential giants move up that's what you know like it's wild how much one signing will affect your you know kind of mentality about a, a team signing drew lock to me says you know that all, that almost took new york off the board for a quarterback in the first round certainly for me not because i think drew lock is you know, a, a top 10 NFL quarterback or a top 15 NFL quarterback, certainly. But, you know, the return of Daniel Jones and adding Drew Locke, that's a that's a lot of capital to put into a quarterback if you didn't trade up to get one. That's that's a lot of invested in the quarterback position, which most important position in sports. You, you want a lot invested there. But 
Um, it's at least something that's been in the back of my mind when thinking about which teams will be aggressive in getting that quarterback. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? John Soto Podcast is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. We did a uh, mock draft, Tony Pauline and I, on our draft season podcast, Matt. And we, I thought, had a pretty realistic scenario where the quarterbacks go the first four, the Vikings trade up to four with Arizona to get the fourth quarterback. Yeah. Then the Chargers, with Jim Harbaugh, say, you know what, we're going to take Joe Walt. And what that yeah. meant is that the Giants... Marvin Harrison Jr. sitting there at five. Whoa. How realistic do you think it is that all three of those wide receivers could be sitting there at six for the Giants? Certainly realistic. Yeah. I, I don't want to say it's likely, but it's probable. You know, it's it's there's definitely that scenario. That's the scenario, you know, of like, yep, that happens. That's realistic. We could see that. And you're sitting there with, you know, all the wide receivers on the board. I saw Jim Harbaugh say this morning, having the fifth pick, if all four quarterbacks are gone, it's like having the first overall pick. Well, this would be like Joe Shane having the first overall pick because the offensive tackle is not going to affect what the New York Giants would do uh, at this spot. So a great, great situation to be in. I think all three of these guys would complement this offense really well. They would complement what, you know, the existing players who were there. Uh, I don't know if you remember, I was a huge Jalen Hyatt fan last year. I can't wait to see him in a, a, a full season. Wondell Robinson, such a good you know, offensive weapon type player. All these guys would complement that. Marvin Harrison Jr. just happens to complement it the best because he is a true X wide receiver. He's one of the best route runners I've ever seen. We're talking about A.J. Green, Larry Fitzgerald type wide receiver uh, who is just incredibly gifted and ready to go right away. For a guy that's six three and a half that can move that way side to side and running his routes, it's it's really yeah. unprecedented. And I'm with you. I don't have neighbors that far behind them, but this is the interesting thing, and I think this is the point you just brought up. I have neighbors as a higher graded player than Odunze, and I like Odunze. He's a top ten guy for me. Pick him, I'll be thrilled. But I think Odunze fits with Hyatt and Robinson a little bit better. To your point, he's more yeah. of that X type receiver, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's a more of that traditional, you know, hey, we're going to flank you out left and and you're going to win 50-50 balls and you're going to run, you know, this this type of route tree. It's not so what he's experienced at. He did it the last two years at Washington with tons of production, tons of success. Now, I think you could build an offense around neighbors with the, excuse me, with the two other guys. Certainly, that works, right? It's a track meet. You can look at the Miami Dolphins. It's a great example of how that works. So it does come down to preference a little bit. What does... Brian Dable want. What does Mike Kafka want? What does what is the like what do Daniel Jones and Drew Locke think? Like I think you're trying to get everyone involved in this decision. So um, you know, it will be fascinating to see if they're presented with that, what they do. I think you take Marvin Harrison Jr. and you you you, you know, high fives all around the draft room and then you you get ready for the second round. Well, how about this, Matt? Let's say Harrison is saying there, even a five for the Chargers, right? We know they've been interested in maybe mm -hmm. moving down, you know, into the teens. You get a you get a tackle there. He can build the team he wants the way that he wants to build it. Do you think there would be teams that would be willing to give up significant capital, trade up for Harrison and not a quarterback? It's hard for me to find that team, you know, to and let's be realistic. The Buffalo Bills are highly unlikely that they would go from 28 to 5. The Kansas City Chiefs, highly unlikely they will go from 32 to 5. That is incredibly expensive to do. And I don't think the Chargers would entertain that. They don't want to fall back that far in the order either. So it's hard for me to find that team that exists in that window. You know, of you're, there's not a team at like 8, 9, 10 that needs to move up that badly. How about or the has the, the assets to do it. They don't have a second round pick though, oh, right? So point. it's like. You point. know, and as as all in as they are, they have to start thinking about at some point they have to think about the future. I, I would think at do some they? point, right? Do they? Uh, you would think <laughs> they have to. So, you know, it's just there's not a lot of teams that, that are in that window to move back from five to where you feel like you're getting a good return on investment and you're staying in your window to get whether it be a tackle or a wide receiver. Would Joe Alt be in a conversation with with you for the Giants if if even two of those three wide receivers are on the board at six? No, he wouldn't be. And I like Joe Alt a lot. Um, he's never played right tackle in his career. Uh, I don't 
I don't know why you would draft a guy just to move him at that spot. I know the Lions did it with Panay Sewell. They've had a lot of success with it. There's not a lot of other precedent for that being a good move in the top 10. So I wouldn't. I think this is a, a you know, adding on to the moves the Giants made in free agency, it is a deep enough draft that I, I think you would rather try to move up from the second round, just up in the second round a little bit to get one of those right tackles, you know, like a Jordan Morgan from Arizona, uh, you know, if he, he if he were to be there. Uh, I would go that route as opposed to Joe Alt at six. And I also think, you know, the drop off from neighbors Odunze to the receivers you could get in, the, in round two, I much, much prefer a neighbors or an Odunze as opposed to like a Xavier Leggett or a Keon Coleman in the second round. No, I agree with you. I'm 100%. I think they're a different tier of player that you can build your offense around and becomes almost a force multiplier uh, for the other people on your offense. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? Uh, I mentioned you did your seven-round mock draft. Everyone should go to ESPN.com or just search for Matt Miller's seven-round mock. It comes up. Uh, you and Malik Neighbors of the Giants at six, which has been a popular pick. Awesome. Sign me up. Where, where do I sign? The interesting <laughs> right. one is the round two pick where you and the Giants drafting Michael Penix Jr. And I like the idea if you yeah. get a quarterback in the first round where if one of those guys that if you think they're good enough, pick them in the second round, try to develop them. And I guess I think value-wise, that's where Penix should go. There seems to be an idea that he's going to go much earlier What's your feel for what yeah. his draft range really is? He has a, a very wide draft range because so much hinges on medicals. And there are going to be teams that give his medicals the thumbs up. There are going to be teams that give his medicals the thumbs down. And that variance is going to be wide. It really is, which is why I think, you know, you see mock drafts that have him in the top 15. You yeah. see mock drafts that have him in the, I have him at 47. And I even wrote in there, I think he's better than the 47th player in this draft. What tends to happen is four or five quarterbacks go early. And then we have all the teams that don't need a quarterback. And so a player like Penix can fall to a spot like, excuse me, like 47, to where it's now a really, really good value. It's just about the medicals. As a pure thrower, very few people in this class can compare to him. Um, you know, no, he's not the most mobile guy. You're, you're going to worry about that a little bit. I think you have to scheme for that. But also, I, I think a lot of times the Giants have been, you know, typecast as, oh, they have to have a running quarterback. They have to have a mobile quarterback. I don't know how much that is the case. We're going to find out a lot about this team, this draft, if they do go with the quarterback, because Drew Locke can certainly move, but he's not a mobile quarterback. Yeah. And it's not like they went and signed Tyler Huntley. You know, they didn't go get a, you know, Justin Fields. They didn't go for a quarterback who has a big, you know, running background. Or even so when I signed Tyrod, like, right? Just bring Tyrod Taylor back. Exactly. Here. Absolutely. You know, so I, I look at Penix and say, no, he's not the most mobile guy, but how much does that actually matter? How much do we think that matters to, Dable and Kafka in this this team. So I think Penix at 47 is a, a steal on value as long as you're okay with the medicals. Yeah, and I think your third-round pick, Christian Haynes out of UConn, is a steal on value too. I think he could easily be a second-round pick, Matt, when all is said and done in this yeah. draft. Your thoughts on Haynes and then in the, the in general, the day-two guard class, if the Giants want to try to continue to uh, shore up their interior offensive line? Yeah, I like Haynes a lot. Powerful player, great in the run game. Uh, and I still look at this roster and I'm looking at that left guard spot of like it, how much, how much of a competition will they they'll be there. I like John Runyon a lot who they added. Uh, I'm very curious to see what their vision for this offensive line is, but day two guard is good. Cooper BB from Kansas state should come off in that range. I mentioned Christian Haynes, Dominic Pooney is going to be there. Uh, Matt Goncalves, Christian uh, Mahogany. It is a really, really good, uh, guard class in rounds two and three. Zach Zender from Michigan, another guy if the medicals are clean, he'll be drafted in that range. So really, really good guard group, probably between picks 50 and 100. Giants fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens, named a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by the Banker as the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle. Citizens is made ready for Giant fans. Learn more at citizensbank.com. All right, Matt, let's go through your last couple of picks here before you say goodbye. Uh, Third round, and I think this is a sweet spot. Either this or round four for the running back class in this draft. You give the Giants Marshawn Lloyd, who I think just from a pure tool, size, speed, athleticism standpoint, he's a top running back in this class. I also like guys like well, Shipley. I think they're really good. Your thoughts on Lloyd and, and the what type of running back do you think Brian Dable would like to add to this group? 
Yeah, that that is a big question. You know, are they looking for more of the James Cook slasher style, who's a good receiver out of the backfield? They're looking for Marshawn Lloyd's more of a punisher. He really is more of a between the tackles guy. You know, five foot nine, two hundred twenty pound back um, is almost more that kind of like Devin Singletary. You know, a player who is you know shorter on the shorter side, but incredibly powerful. You know, he broke out at USC after starting his career at South Carolina uh, and, and proved to be, I think, one of the more decisive runners in this class has really really good vision whether that be off tackle or, or inside zone type plays so uh big huge fan of lloyd he's not my top running back i have jonathan brooks there but i know some teams believe he is the top back in this class so uh, again you're drafting someone i think you know similar in style to singletary but has a higher upside coming into the nfl then you have tyler davis in round number five to the giants matt and he's a guy that I think is just kind of as solid as you come. Defensive tackle. He can stop the run well. He's yep. a little bit of pass rush juice. I thought he was good in Mobile. Yeah, same here. That was my my big note on him was I liked him a lot in Mobile. Uh, kind of under the radar for that Clemson D-line this past year. But someone I know, I was talking to scouts about him a year ago, you know, because there was a thought that he would have been in that 2023 draft class. People were already evaluating him. Um, but he does. He he brings more pass rush juice than I think he was able to show at Clemson. I think at times he was asked to, you know, be a run first guy, but go back to his freshman tape when they were loaded up front and he was free to, to, you know, penetrate a little bit more in one gap and he really, really shined. So uh, again, Dexter Lawrence is great. You've got one, one tackle spot locked down, but I think Davis could be a, a guy that's a, at least a rotational defensive tackle. And then finally, Matt, and we're going to hold we're going to hold these to you. Every one of these seven round map draft picks have got to be right. All two fifty seven. I hope so. Yeah, right. Yeah, you have to hit them all. I mean, it's 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 really yep. not that hard. I don't understand why you can't do it. Um, right. <laughs> but the seventh round pick, Willie Willie Drew, cornerback, Virginia State. Give me the lowdown. Yeah, I mean, small school guy, but uh, you know, five interceptions. I, I think two years ago, six interceptions last year. Had over thirty passes defense the last two seasons, and at a small school like that's what I'm always looking for is like, do you have dominant production or athleticism? Like, do you have one or the other? He's got both, and so I, I think as a late round pick, I, you want to bet on that upside and that production. And you know, guys come out of that range all the time that surprise us and become really good NFL players. All right, final question before we say goodbye, Matt. As of what we know now, recording this at uh, around two twenty on April fourth. What do you think the most likely selection is for the Giants at sixth overall? Oh, my goodness. I'll say Malik Neighbors. I'll stick with that one for now. Um, it's uh, it's going to get crazy at the top of this draft. I really do believe that. We haven't even got to the point where we, we start to hear about who wants to trade up. But I'll, I'll go Malik Neighbors for now. By the way, I don't think these trades can happen until draft night, by the way. Just for the record, like, until you know who Washington's taking it to, how exactly. are you going to trade up to three yep. or, or even four? It, it's tough. You could do a lot of work. You could set the table for the trade, right. but it's all contingent on, like we're saying in New England, you can have, hey, we like Drake May if he's gone, we'll trade. Or we like Jaden Daniels if he's gone, we'll trade. You can do all that. But until Washington makes that pick, uh, we, will, we won't we will know. And that's what makes it fun this year is we know who the first pick will be. We'll get to have the little celebratory Caleb Williams, 10 minutes. And then we're all going to wonder what happens next. All right, Matt, tell the folks where to find your great work. Yeah, ESPN.com, or you can follow along on social media at NFL Draft Scout. Perfect. Matt, good stuff, my friend. Always good talking to you, brother. Yeah, appreciate you, man. Matt Miller, Giants Little Podcast. We'll see you next time, everybody. 